You can open your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. We'll be in verses 13 through 18. You have said harsh things against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said, it is futile to serve God. What did we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly the evildoers prosper, and even those who challenge God escape. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. They will be mine, says the Lord Almighty, in the day when I make up my treasure possession. I will spare them, just as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. All right, thank you, Wendell. All right, so we're, we're almost through the book of Malachi. We're almost through Advent. And um, well, let, me, let me pray for us before I start getting into it. We're, we'll dive right in. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for, for your presence here. We thank you, Lord, for what a blessing it is to come and worship, worship you in your house. And we come expectantly, Lord, and humbling ourselves before you, Lord, knowing our need for, for you and for you to meet with us. We pray that your word, Lord, this morning would, would bring encouragement, would bring direction, um, correction, Lord, as, as you see fit, Lord, in our hearts and in our lives. And we invite you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, if, you, if you feel like as, we, as, as this passage opened, um, you kind of heard this before, um, it, it's one, again, Malachi's starting in his typical fashion where he's, he has this disputation between um, saying what, this is what the Lord says, this is what you say back, um, but he's also, even the content of what's being said here is very familiar, very similar to what he's, he's said before. This passage kind of brings a lot of stuff together that's come before. And um, so one, one interesting difference, though, in this passage is that where it says in verse 14, you have said, um, in the past, it, it's kind of Malachi, what, what most commentators think was going on is that Malachi was kind of expressing what the people maybe wanted to say, what was in their hearts, but not necessarily something that he, they said. Um, in this case, the, the, the Hebrew that um, gives, gives us the idea that they not only said these things, but it was in discussion with each other. Um, this, is, this is sort of what they were talking about amongst themselves. And that's an interesting picture because it, it, it shows us that God, you know, when, when we're talking among ourselves, God's there, and he's listening. And it's, it's kind of a, a sobering thought. I don't know if you guys um, had the same kind of Sunday school teachers as me, but in Sunday school, one of my teachers, I can still picture her, would sing this song, um, Be Careful Little Mouth What You Say, Be Careful Little Eyes What You See. Do you guys, anyone know that song? Okay, it's scary. It's like, like, we're going to talk about the fear of God, but this is kind of to instill the fear of God. It was like, be careful, little mouth, what you say. Be careful, little mouth, what you say, because the Father up above is looking down in love. Well, that's looking down in love, so be careful, little mouth, what you say. But, but, um, but the picture here is of folks talking together, and God's there, um, and he's listening. And Shakespeare talked about all the, uh, our, our, every, our lives are a stage. And if it is, then God's, God's the audience. He, and that's, that is a sobering thought. And so these, these quotes um, are probably what was spoken one to another. 
Um, and the, we're going we're gonna to get into what, what I want us to, to look at is there's two conversations that happen. There's this conversation that uh, Malachi is bringing up that God overheard among the people. Then there's another conversation we're going to see in verses 16 and 17 that's sort of the, the righteous folks talking together um, in a way that, that God esteemed. Um, so we want to look at um, we want to look at both of those, uh, and and then we'll we'll kind of wrap it up with the promises that are given in verses 17 and 18. Um, I, and I want us to talk about ways when we look at these first three verses. I want us to talk about ways we are tempted to think and speak during hard times. Ways we are tempted to speak and think during hard times. And I think um, it would be easy to say. Uh, this is sort of the ways of the wicked or something like that. But I, I don't think that's what's going on here. These are people trying to work out, trying to serve God, trying to work out um, what that looks like in really difficult times. And I was reminded as I looked at these verses that you see a very similar thing in Psalm 73, for example. And I'll give you a couple verses where the psalmist says, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. And have washed my hands in innocence. We are going to feel this way sometimes. Like, why have I tried to, to be good? Why have I tried to do what the Lord commands? Why have I tried to serve the Lord? That's the kind of thing that they're wrestling with because things are so difficult. And uh, this psalmist says, all day long I've been afflicted. What I've gotten in return is affliction. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. And um, it gets very difficult to persevere in walking with the Lord and following the Lord and following his commands when it feels like we're, we're doing everything we can, and yet things continue to be difficult. And the psalmist, because he's, because he's pushing into the Lord, because he's seeking him, he, he gets to a point where he understands and God brings relief from this. But he's in, he's in turmoil that's very similar to what these folks are saying. And so I think it's important that we see this as this isn't sort of wicked folks like um, trying to speak blasphemously against God. This is people trying to work out how, how we can understand what's going on in the midst of such hard times. Okay, so ways we are tempted to think and speak during hard times. And what you see in this passage, it says, um, you know, at first it says, you have spoken arrogantly against me. Arrogantly could be translated harshly. And, and then they ask, what have, what have we said against you? And, and he brings up, they said these things. It is futile to serve God. It doesn't do any good. Um, what do we gain by carrying out all his requirements? Going about like mourners before the Lord. And what we, what we see in that, that we've got to be careful of, is that serving, is that idea that serving God ought to result in tangible or specific blessings. So they're saying it's futile to serve God when they say that. They're saying, I should receive something for this. Like, it shouldn't be, my life shouldn't be like this when I'm trying to serve the Lord. Um, so there should be some kind of blessing, some kind of tangible or specific blessing. The last part of it is sort of the flip side. And then we see these guys doing evil, and they seem to be blessed. Why don't we just go and do it? That's, that seems, seems logical. We're trying to do, do what God says, and, and we're getting punished, and then look at these guys. That's the heart of what they're saying. And, and the idea behind that is that serving God, this, this idea that serving God ought to result in tangible or specific blessings. It's not... It's not um, hard to understand how they got that idea. If y'all were with us last week, and I'm not going to go back and read it, you can read it, but we saw God give specific promises. You'll remember, he said, test me in this. He said, bring your tithe, bring the whole tithe, and then see what I'm going to do. I'm going to pour out so much blessing that you won't have a place to store it. And so you kind of scratch your head and you say, well, God's giving them that motivation. 
He's telling them to give because what he's going to give to them. What's the, and then he doesn't. What's the, they should be complaining, right? What's the rub? I remember a time in my, my life where God, God put on my heart to get, to, to give away most of the money that I had left in my bank account at a time when I was single. And, 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 and he was teaching me to live by faith. He had, he had put a lot, of, a lot of things on my heart about what he wanted to teach me about living by faith. And so I did it. And, and then I, it felt so good afterwards. But I, in, in, my, in my heart, I felt like, man, the blessing is coming. And, and what happened was I went out that morning to find a parking ticket on my car. And then all kinds of other stuff, like multiple things happened. And I was like, God, how, like, this is what you do? <laughs> and, and the Lord eventually, the Lord, the Lord s- spoke to me and he said, Scott, what I'm, what I'm wanting to bless you with is, is faith that's of more worth than, than any of that. I want to teach you that. But what, what is going on? How are we supposed to understand that? God promised. Why shouldn't they be upset? And here's what I think, um, how we ought to understand this difference. God is motivating the people to trust him and give generously. And he does promise his blessing. But the heart of the difference is this, that he asks us to do what we do, to give and to offer to him by faith by faith. And faith, faith is not, faith is different. He, he talks later about serving as children in a household. When we serve, like our, our, our boss, we, we work and we expect something in return for our work. That is not how we serve God. We serve God by faith. We serve God trusting that he has adopted us. He has given us everything. He has brought us into his house so that everything that's his is ours, and he's going to give us what's good for us. And so when we we do these things, when we give our tithe, we trust we trust that God's bless, God is going to bless us, but we don't demand that it looks in any specific way or comes in a specific time. He doesn't tell us when the blessing is going to come. He doesn't tell us exactly what it's going to look like. But he will be faithful to his promise. The difference is we've got to walk. We've got to walk by faith and trust him. In Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. It's when we're going after the Lord, when we're seeking him and his righteousness, that he promises to provide everything we need. We don't need to be anxious about stuff. He'll take care of it. He'll provide what we need. But, see, he doesn't always provide what we think we need. He doesn't always provide it when we think we need it. But he's asked us to go in faith and to trust that it will come. Trust me. I'll take care of you. I'll take care of it. And it's the blessings of God are like, they're like the waves that trail a boat. They're going to come. And they'll be, they'll, they'll, they'll be behind us. We'll be able to look back and see them. We'll be able to look back and say, oh my gosh, God did bless me. He blessed me with this. He blessed me with that. We'll be able to look back and see that. But if we're trying to, if we're trying to see them, um, if we stop the boat and we say, where are the blessings? What's going on? We're not going to see any waves. We're not going to see them. It's as we go, as we seek his kingdom, as we move in faith, he promises to take care of us. He promises to bless us. Okay, so we see, we got to be careful of this idea that serving God ought to result in tangible or specific blessings. All of us at times, we get to places where we say, God, this is what I want from you. Like God... Do this for me. And we can ask him. But even when we ask him, we trust that he's going to give us every gift that's going to be a blessing to us. If he withholds it, it's because he's good beyond measure and he knows something we don't know. And so when I say, God, I, okay, I just, this is the only thing I want. I want that, I want that house. Help us to get it. 
He might not give it. I want, I want, I want to get married. I want this family. I want this specific thing. God is not holding out on you because he doesn't want you to be happy, because he doesn't want you to be blessed. And it's admittedly a hard place to be when there's something you're asking God for. But he wants us to trust him. He wants us, as we go forward, as we seek his kingdom, to trust that he's going to provide all that we need, that he delights to give good gifts. I'll tell you, as a parent, and some of y'all have experienced this, the biggest joy at Christmas is, is like when your kids are young and you, you get these, I mean, it sounds like so much about material things, but there's a, a joy in just seeing your kids open something and be blessed. Like God wants, God delights, I believe God delights in giving good gifts to us. He wants to. We've got to trust him that he knows what's good and he knows when to give it. Okay, notice one other thing. Notice that these, these kind of thoughts can become resolved so that our self-interest becomes a part of the way we see the world. Look at what it says. But now we call the arrogant blessed. Um, this becomes a way of seeing, a way of understanding what's going on around them. Now we call the arrogant blessed, and he goes on. And this should tell us a couple things. One thing it should tell us is that our conversations can have a detrimental effect on other people. Okay, we know that. They're, they're having conversations with each other, and those conversations talking about, they might have started out, hey, man, look at these guys. Life is easy for them. Now, what, are we, what are we doing all this stuff for? And life is easy and looks fun for them. And then that becomes the arrogant are blessed. It becomes something resolved. It becomes a way, a filter through which we see things. And we, we see in, in the Old Testament a, a great example of what happens when we talk in ways that aren't honoring to the Lord, to one another, when the, when the spies come back from the land. And they say, man, the land is great. It's everything the Lord said it is. But there's giants there. We're never going to get in. And that spread through the whole, the whole group of the Israelites so that they were terrified. Even though the Lord had promised, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'll go before you. I'll, I'll, do the, I'll do the fighting. We've got to be careful as we, as we talk to each other because it can, this kind of unbelief can settle in on us and it can become a filter that we see things through. One thing I think it's important for us to see as we talk about self-interest becoming a part of the world that we see, we've got to recognize a part of the way we see the world. We've got to recognize that we're sort of pressed into a mold to make self-interest sort of first priority. That's, that's the, the moment that we're, we're living in. And we're, we're tempted and encouraged to make decisions even in our spiritual life based on the benefit to us. How's it going to benefit me? Um, How's it going to make me feel better? Uh, is, it, is it something I can handle? What will, what will make me the happiest? These are the kind of things that we, kind of ways that we, we often make decisions based on self-actualization, my own freedom, my own peace. And we're, I think we're pressed into that kind of a mold. When we do that, I... I Tim Keller recently came out with a book on forgiveness that I think gives us a good, uh, a good picture of how this, how this works in our lives or how this doesn't work in our lives. But, um, you know, we're encouraged, as I mentioned, to make decisions in our spiritual life based on our benefit to us. And maybe nowhere is that more clear than with forgiveness and forgiving people. It's hard to forgive people. And so Tim Keller says, if, if, Self-interest is our motivation for forgiveness. We're never going to get there. Why? Because in hard situations. Why? Because it's not going to always feel like the, the cost justifies the benefit that we see. It's painful to forgive. It's difficult to forgive. And it might just feel better to say, I'm going to hang on to this and I'm going to try not to nurse a grudge. I'm going to try not to be real angry, but I, I'm just going to hold it. And I'm going to make it through with this person. When self-interest is, 
is our motivator, we're often not going to get to forgiveness. And this is why, as we're going to come into the next section, our motivation has to be something else. It has to be, it has to be honoring the Lord. It has to be fear of the Lord. It has to be at some point because God, God says, God commands me to forgive. And I might not feel like I can handle it right now. I might, I might feel like it's, and it's a process often. Um, and I, I really recommend this book for those of you that struggle with the, the issue of forgiveness. But th the point here is that when self-interest becomes sort of the, the way, um, the, the lens through which we, we make decisions as far as our spiritual life, like I'm, um, you know, I, I'm not really feeling fasting right now. I'm not really feeling this. If, if, it, if that becomes the lens th that we make decisions through, we're going we're gonna to justify ourselves not doing stuff that God commands us to do and miss out on some of the blessing. All of those things, peace, freedom, s forgiveness is going to give us all that. Man, forgiveness sets us free. God wants our best. But it's if we're motivated by what we think is going gonna, is gonna to do, do the best for us, we're, we're often not going to get there. It, it also relates to, to justice. And look at this quote from Tim Keller's book. Forgiveness, he says, is not the opposite of seeking true justice. It is, among many other things, its precondition. Sometimes, and this is, this is a, um, something that we'll hear, we'll hear out there a lot um, in dialogues about working this kind of thing out. Forgiveness, forgiveness, some people say, is you don't encourage people to forgive because it lets someone off the hook. Um, it's, it sort of allows someone freedom, um, uh, it allows someone to get away with something, allows justice not to happen, and, and Tim Keller rightly says, no, God's, God's logic is different and right, and his justice is right, and, and forgiveness is actually a precondition. We've got to forgive before justice can happen. Why? Because any time we're trying to reconcile, we're trying to make things right, we're trying to make a situation right. If we haven't forgiven, there's going to be some vengeance, some degree of vengeance, most likely, in the way we approach the person. But once we've forgiven, the person, the, the person that uh, offended did something that was just wrong can face what they're doing without the vengeance involved. And so he says it's a precondition. See, if with many things in the Christian life, forgiveness included, if self-interest is our lens and self-interest was the lens of the people, what's going what's gonna to benefit me? It's easy to slip into that. If self-interest is our lens, we're not going to get, we're not going to get to obedience and we're not going to get to the, the blessing. And so in our thinking of, and in our conversations, when things are difficult, we need to be aware that we can radically shift from a prodigal son perspective. Y'all remember the prodigal son? He came back and he said, I'm just blessed to be in my father's house again. I'll, I'll just do what the slaves do. I just want to serve. I just want to be in this house. And, I, and I'm, I feel so blessed. And he got a party. But we can easily switch from being that, serving God in that way as a prodigal son to serving God as the elder brother who's saying, wait a second, what's in this for me? Like, look at how come other people are getting blessed? What's, God, don't you see? Like, haven't I, haven't I been doing all this stuff? We can easily get there. And so we've got to watch ourselves. We've got to watch ourselves in hard times. And the prophet here is, is writing to these folks to, to, tell, to tell them, soften your hearts. Humble yourself. God, God wants to renew you. He wants to bless you, but it's not going to come. It's not going to come that way. It's not going to come with a, a proud heart that demands something of God. It's going to come when you, you humble yourself before him, and we're going to see um, walk in the ways that these folks walk in the, in the next conversation. It's interesting. It's, it's not clear, but um, 
some commentators think there's a, there's a then there as you go into verse 16, and some commentators think this scene maybe followed right after what Malachi spoke. Malachi spoke this, and some folks started talking together and started humbling themselves and started having different kinds of conversations. That's certainly what Malachi wants to happen. Um, and so it says in verse 16, Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. Okay, so what, here's what right conversations look like during hard times. What right conversations look like during hard times. It says again, those who feared the Lord talked with each other. Um, they, they came together and, 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 and talked together, and I would think probably encouraged each other in some of the attitudes that are mentioned here. But there's two key attitudes that are mentioned. Those who, it says then, those who feared the Lord. The first attitude is the fear of the Lord. What describes these folks is that they feared the Lord. And this is kind of a, an idea that I think is pretty foreign to a lot of us. We don't, we don't understand it so well. It doesn't mean fear maybe the way that we, we think being afraid of, but it means like a deep reverence of. We don't tend to see any kind of authority in just culturally, and there's some good to this, um, certainly a whole lot of good to this, we don't see any authority in a, in a sort of reverenced way, but we've got to see the Lord that way. And, and these folks, they revered the Lord. Here's, here's what it says. I'm going to give us three verses from Proverbs and Psalms. Here's what it says about fear, the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 23, 17. Do not let your heart envy sinners. Now, again, this is exactly what these folks were doing, right? Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Just recognize there how those are, those are opposites of each other. Don't let your heart envy sinners. Instead, be always zealous for the fear of the Lord. And then in, in Psalm 111.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It says that multiple times in Scripture. This is one of them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. It's the beginning of wisdom. If we want to understand, we're, we've been talking about how we decide things in the spiritual life, how we decide what to do, what to go after, how we decide how to... How to, how to live our lives, when we make those kind of decisions, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it's going to, it's going to lead to following God's precepts. All who follow his precepts have understanding, or in other words, have been enlightened by the wisdom that comes from the fear of the Lord. And the last one, this one doesn't mention the fear of the Lord at all, but I think it's implied and it, it has a lot of relevance for what we've been looking at in Malachi, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Some of you are mouthing the words along with me. This is a great verse to memorize. Some of you haven't memorized. It's great. But trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So much of what happened, so much of what was going on in that dialogue, the dialogues that folks were having was a lot of leaning on their own understanding. Like this is how, uh, let's make sense of this together and it wasn't looking pretty. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and when we do that and we don't lean on our own understanding, he'll make our paths straight. Okay, so two attitudes. The first one, the, they feared the Lord. The second one, they honored his name. 
Those who feared the Lord talked with each other. The Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in their presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. This is a very close idea to, to fearing the Lord. It's, it's having a high regard for God. Um, there's a great verse again in Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. That I think speaks to how this, how does the, the honoring the Lord and honoring his name affect our speech? How does the fear of the Lord affect our speech? Look at what it says in Ecclesiastes 5, 1 and 2. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth. Let your words be few. Um, when, I, when I see especially this one verse here, it says, Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Um, that really parallels some of what we've seen in the book of Malachi. What was going on with, with those folks is they were, they were coming and bringing their offerings when, and, and on Sunday they were looking good. They were, they were looking like they were revering the Lord, but then on Monday through Saturday they were doing other stuff, not treating their, their fellow brothers and sisters right, not being faithful. And so it says, don't come to offer the sacrifice of fools. Sometimes, sometimes, see, when, when, we, when we are doing something for the Lord, when we are offering him something, when we, are, when we have one part of our life that's right, we can sometimes focus on that and, and feel, allow that to let us feel good about ourselves and blind us to other stuff that we're doing that's not honoring to the Lord. It says here that, who th these folks did not know that they do wrong. Uh, it can blind us to, to other stuff that we're doing. We can be so about a cause and so, so passionate about a cause that, and, and people can give us props for what we're, what we're doing in that area, so much so that we, we let ourselves off the hook for how we're living in other areas of our lives. And that's the opposite of what it is to fear the Lord. Um, so we fear the Lord, we honor his name. These are the two attitudes you see, but I want us to notice also what God does for those who have these kind of conversations, who have these kind of attitudes. This is incredible. Look at what it says God does for them. He listens and hears. Now, of course, we know that he was listening to the other conversation because it kind of upset him. Um, he was listening to that other conversation, but when it brings it out, when, when the prophet brings it out here and says he listens and hears, it's, it's making explicit that God is hearing and listening to what you're saying to each other. He's, he's honored by it. He hears you. The highest, you know, uh, the, the the highest form of love we can offer someone is listening to them. God listens to you. He's listening. And he's listening to those folks. And, it, and it's in a way that blesses him. He takes notice. I think about Job. God bragged about Job to Satan and to the heavenly host because things were, things were rough in his life. God allowed things to get rough, and he still praised him. That's, what's go, that's, that's the picture of what's going on here. These folks are still honoring the Lord, even though life has been incredibly difficult, and God's listening to it. And maybe he's bragging about it to Satan. Who knows? But he remembers what you do. He also remembers what you do and say. This is, this is incredible. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord. God wrote down what they said. God wrote down what they were doing. So take, this, take us back to this, 
start of this passage, these folks were saying, we are doing all these things and you don't notice. You aren't blessing us. We are serving you and stuff continues to, we, we just get afflictions. And, and God says here, those that feared me, those that honored my name, I not only noticed, I wrote, I wrote down in a scroll what they were doing. I notice. You know what? God sees you when you're serving, when you give. It says we ought to give in a way that our right hand doesn't know what our left hand is doing so that we can be rewarded. Know something. When you do, when you give to the Lord out of fear of the Lord, when you do it in a way where your right hand doesn't know what your left hand is doing, God knows what you're doing. He sees you. When you have these conversations and you're humbling yourself and you're encouraging other people and helping them to trust in the Lord, God sees you. He writes it down. It touches his heart so much that he records it. And you might not feel it. Things might not get better. But no, God wants his people to know he takes notice. And he'll never forget. It's written down. Okay, so two different kinds of conversations. And the prophet wants to motivate people towards the second one. Humble yourselves. Be like these folks. And, and they may have humbled themselves right there on the spot. And that's an amazing picture if they did. Because right there, they humble themselves. They have this, this conversation of repentance, of, of uh, fearing the Lord. And God right there is touched by them, listens, and writes it down. Okay, so what... The last thing I want us to look at is what should motivate our conversation in hard times. And we see this in the last part. What should motivate our conversation in hard times? It says, says here in verse 17, On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. Now that's, that might be a little bit of a hard thing to swallow because on the day when he acts is is talking about when he comes back. It's talking about his second coming. It's talking even here about the second coming of Jesus. On the day when I act, and God is pointing them to his coming, he tells them, then they will see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Man, that means, you realize what that means? In this life, there's going to be all kinds of times you're going to be able to see people and say, man, that person, they get away with everything. And they seem so blessed and nothing ever affects them. You're going to see that all the time in this life. But what God promises, he says, when I act, then there's going to be a distinction between the righteous and the wicked. There's going to be a distinction between these folks that fear God and these folks that that don't. These folks that speak against me. There's going to be a distinction between those two. And it'll all make sense then. Justice will, justice will happen. But it's going to be on the day when I act. So what should motivate us going forward? If someone were to ask, man, you know, we go back to the beginning of this. God wants me to be motivated by blessing Okay, but how long do I have to wait? Because I've been, I've been seeking the Lord, I've been serving the Lord, I've been fearing Him, and life's just been more and more difficult. And sometimes there's not answers for those things. Sometimes the darkness doesn't lift, sometimes depression doesn't lift, sometimes anxiety doesn't lift, and it's not that you're doing something wrong. It's not that you're not fearing the Lord. Sometimes stuff is just difficult, and we need brothers and sisters to come around us. And we say, how long? There's psalms that say, how long? And the answer, if we look at this, is we got to keep pressing on till the Lord comes again. We're not promised, we're not promised any specific blessing. We're promised that God 
is good without end, and he has our, our best in mind. He wants, he's going to give us everything that's going to be for our good, but we're not promised anything specific, and we're, and we're encouraged here. What ought to motivate us is that in the end, God is making all things new, and he is, he is going to show his righteousness and justice. That was what realizing that and having it sink in was what allowed the psalmist in Psalm 73 to um, to finally finally come out of the clouds and 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 be renewed in in how he was drawing near to the Lord. Okay, so we got to wait till he comes. Look at what it says in James 5, 7 through 9. I've been meditating a lot on these verses lately. Be patient then, brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. Now, this was written in light of a lot of injustice and oppression. He was talking about the rich and how they oppress and how they use their power in wicked ways. And and then he says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. And then he attaches it to our conversations with each other. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Now look at two things it says about the Lord's coming. It says, be patient all the way until he comes. We've got to be patient all the way until he comes. We've got to keep looking for his coming. And as we look for his coming, as we we meditate on what it means that he's coming, um, Him setting all things right. Him bringing justice. This is coming into our world. As we meditate on that, it strengthens us. It says in James, be patient and stand firm. Why? Because the Lord's coming is near. We renew ourselves in that truth that the Lord's coming is near. This is what it means to live by faith and not by sight. We believe and trust that God's faithful to his promises no matter what comes our way. And we believe it patiently, waiting until the end, until he comes back. Notice that he says, I will spare them as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. Now that in their conversation, in the first conversation, the folks were saying, man, we've been serving and we deserve something. And the Lord doesn't say, I'm going I'm to give you the blessing you deserve. Even when he's talking about the righteous, he's talking about those who fear him, those who he wrote down a remembrance for. No, he's sparing them, and, that, and they have no problem with that because they're humbling themselves, realizing, man, I don't deserve, the only thing I have to claim before the Lord is mercy. The only thing I have... That's what it means to be humble. We come before him and we say, Lord, be merciful to me. Forgive me. And he says, I'll spare them. That's the confidence, the, the confidence that we can have, though, brothers and sisters, as we come to the Lord, as we humble ourselves before him, as we trust in his promises, he will save us, he will spare us, as a father spares his children, we come to him with that, with that faith and trust. That's what he asks of us. And it's faith that allows us to be right with God. These folks were right with God as soon as they humbled themselves and feared him. Why? Because they trusted in him. As we trust in his promises, as, as we tr- trust that he says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, he will spare us. He will forgive us. He will make us right with him. God God wanted to encourage the hearts of those folks saying things um, against him. Those tempted to harden their hearts, he wanted to encourage them to humble themselves. And he also wanted to encourage those uh, those of them who, who were fearing God to keep persevering all the way to the end. We can help each other to do that, brothers and sisters. And I'm going to close with this quote in Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. Here's the kind of conversation we can have with each other that will bless, that will bless and, and encourage. 
It says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Let's encourage each other to trust the Lord. Let's encourage each other to fear the Lord. Let's encourage each other to honor the Lord. Let's set an example of doing that so others can be, can be encouraged to follow. Amen? Father, we thank you, Lord, as we come to you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that... Um, we thank you that you've given us such amazing and precious promises and that you are coming again, Lord. And we want to choose this morning, Lord, to humble ourselves. Choose this morning, Lord, to worship you. Choose to bow before you, Lord, and allow you to have your way with us. And help us to encourage one another in that, Lord, because it's difficult. And especially in these times, Lord, it's difficult. But we trust you. We trust you who are able to keep us from falling and keep us to the end. In Jesus' name, amen.